Hello and welcome to Better Under Pressure. I'm Sarah Milne author of The Shed Method and founder of Coaching Impact. And in this podcast, I talk to leaders from all walks of life about being better under pressure and using pressure for better. I want to explore how we handle pressure in a world that is becoming more and more complex, the impact that that pressure has on our ability to perform at our best and what we do to be better under pressure. I've been set up to lose and all I want to do is escape. So I'm just thinking, you know, here's the pressure. I want to escape. What can I do to get out of this? Can he make a phone call and change the fighter? What can he do? (laughs) And, you know, can I just cancel? And and so, you know, what what he did and it was and he absolutely nailed it as a mentor. Right. He looked at me in the eyes. He put his hand out on my heart, on my chest here, and he could feel my heart rate just going through the roof. And he said to me, he looked at me in the eyes and he said to me, not matter, you fight you. Today, I'm talking to Sebastian Bates, founder of the Warrior Academy, an award-winning global martial arts organization, which has so far been responsible for developing the character of 25,000 children across three continents. Social enterprise and philanthropy are at the heart of Sebastian's charity work in the Bates Foundation. He's also a two-time best-selling author in a field of character development and anti-bullying. Having studied six styles of martial arts for 25 years and competing in four of them at national level, Sebastian is a former international professional fighter. He's also an experienced wingsuit base jumper with over 500 jumps around the world to his name. He was part of an elite group of extreme sports athletes pushing forward human flight until July 2014, when during a wingsuit base jump in Switzerland, his parachute collapsed when he was 50 feet from the ground. He survived the fall, but not without devastating damage to his lower body, prompting surgeons to say that he would never walk again. Unsurprisingly, Sebastian defied the odds by rebuilding his body piece by piece through a gruelling rehabilitation process and made a full recovery. He's now on a mission to inspire a generation to make a global impact. In our conversation, Seb discusses why he's thankful for negative thoughts, how he translates pressure into performance, and what happened when he came up against a group of gamblers in Thailand. Seb, fantastic to have you. On Thank you for having me, Sarah. Oh, I'm really excited about this conversation. <laughs> You are in the bucket of potentially being a bit of a pressure junkie. So I want to unpick that a little bit because there's uh, (laughs) lots of richness in there, I think. When do you remember first experiencing a feeling of pressure and how would you describe it? First experiencing pressure. So I grew up in um, an army environment. I I grew up in Aldershot. My dad was a para. And so from a very young age, I kind of, experience the pressure of performing to a high level physically i would say um you know my life was at that age you know six to eight filled with abseiling off garages doing assault courses watching my dad jump out of planes all the time all this sort of stuff um so i guess pressure for me started from a young age doing various physical challenges and um, mm. i think that my my the family i've grown up in you know, we are very, very competitive. And um, so for, for what would have felt like pressure for some people would, for me, would have been normal. So I can't really go back to that period where I first, you know, when I, when I was in my younger years and see that as pressure because that would just be normal life. But if you pick that apart, you can probably find pressure. And um, so for me, if I had to look back, I'd probably say, um, I'd probably say when I first started competing in martial arts to a, to a higher level, the thing about martial arts is you're you're kind of on your own in a, in the arena in the ring whatever it is right so you're the one handling that pressure on your own even if you're only seven or eight years old um i think i started when i was about seven or eight um i did my first english championships when i was about nine um, and so you know there's there's no one there with you you have to mm. understand and you know translate pressure into performance and so i think that uh, learning to do that at that age would have been my first yeah. kind of experience of of high pressure but you know what's so interesting already in this conversation is that and it reminds me actually because last week I spoke to Tendi Sherpa who mm. told the story of for him pressure began when he was five because he used to walk for two days 
He has to have a wow. two day walk to go to school, a, you know, meeting tigers and bears. I mean, like, you know, it was like something out of a fantasy book, to be honest. But yeah. what I think is interesting and in what you're saying, which is connected to that is when you're introduced to pressure as not being uh, debilitating, I suppose, you know, you, you were given a very positive view of pressure at a very young age. I'm getting more and more convinced that when we get given that picture earlier, it sort of already starts to strengthen something that feels very powerful. And that's what I'm hearing from you a little bit. And then so you go then into an environment of martial arts where you're very much on your own. You haven't got your dad. You haven't got, you know, that. but you've already got a bit of a muscle worked up to be able to deal with that, I'm assuming. Yeah, 100%. It, it's, it's really interesting you should say that as well, yeah. because, you know, I, I, I kind of feel like pressure is getting a bit of a bad rap these days, right? <laughs> People, people are, are kind of avoiding pressure and, and seeing pressure as this big negative thing where, you know, you don't you really don't tend to get things done without a higher level of pressure or at least a decent amount of pressure to cause a change. And so for me, especially having worked with, you know, we're, we're essentially talking about children right at this stage. And so, we're not, you know, having worked with kind of 25,000 children around the world, it's there, there is a fine now, balance. What you're doing now, you mean? Yeah. Over the last 10, 12 years. Yeah. With what I'm doing now with the Warrior yeah. Academy. Yeah. I mean, it's the insights I've got from that. are it, There's really this this there's a relationship with pressure, like you say, or the comfort zone. And there's a relationship with, you know, how, how the parents see it. And for a lot of different cultures that we teach, you know, there's for some parents, they really overly pressure their kids and they develop an unhealthy relationship for it. Okay. And some parents under pressure their kids. And I kind of see it like the comfort zone because in the comfort zone, you've obviously got the, everyone's familiar with the, with the classic comfort zone, right? We know we need to leave our comfort zone in order to grow, but that's where we pretty much leave it. Comfort zone and then the good stuff happens. It's not quite like that. For a lot of people, they've got the comfort zone. They know, they know how to leave that. But for highly competitive parents, they push their children outside of their comfort zone into the hyper anxiety stage. And so this is where they, you know, they are performing tasks outside of that, way outside of their ability. They can't complete it. And then they retract back in that comfort zone and they don't want to do it again. And they build an unhealthy relationship with pressure. And so I've kind of seen it from both angles. I've seen it from someone pushing their kids way too much and yep. someone pushing them outside of their comfort zone so it becomes normal and they have that healthy relationship and they want to repeat it again. So yes. I've, I've, definitely seen, I've definitely seen it from both sides. And, and how... As a kid, do you feel you got that healthy balance with it? Because you could easily have come from a, a father like, you know, the one you described, who's got a, a very high challenging um, job with pressure. How, how do you see it staying healthy? What were the ingredients that allowed it for you, from what you remember anyway, uh, being healthy? I think one of the one of the key things I found with, you know, with with in encouraging pressure from a young age is there's there's got to be some sort of reward structure in place what a, ch a child is typically very extrinsically motivated right and a lot of our work with kids is, is is developing drive in young people to do that we need to take them from extrinsic to intrinsic motivation mm -hmm. early on they need a lot of rewards they need small goals they need all this sort of stuff which build that build that drive and um, what i found and one of the biggest mistakes which contributes to this unhealthy relationship with pressure is that there is no reward so typically what you'll find is a child goes and does something outside of their comfort zone comes back and there's no kind of you know big celebration about what they've done whereas when I look back to my childhood the whole family would come together to celebrate you know a, a, a one of our successes no matter if it was a it was a friendly football game or some some sort of success at school or a big you know national competition the whole family would be celebrating the whole evening um, and so that really builds a solid reinforcement of the relationship between pressure and success and that good feeling and that dopamine hit of look what I've achieved I want to do it again and then you've got that solid foundation of you know the community there to support you and um, when things don't go right you yeah. know and even even when things didn't go well it was having that you know when you when you when you experience failure having that same support in place so for me those, those are the kind of secret ingredients if you like that they seem obvious but people so often forget them yeah yeah so there you're talking very much around the um, the people around you also celebrating so that you're, you're feeling like, yes, I've stretched, I've, I've, I've done something and I've, I've got myself out of my comfort zone. And it's being a, I love this idea of the reward. How do you do that when you're on your own? 
So having moved then into martial arts and then, you know, yeah. becoming a very high performer within the martial arts uh, before and before setting up Warrior Academy, how did you start to learn to do that on your own? I think you you gradually learn to plan goals and 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 plan rewards. But do you know what? If I'm completely honest, I'm 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 absolutely terrible at it. Like um, I I don't really feel like I need rewarding. I just this is just a way of life for me. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, and and I think you know I, I think from a young age, right? When I, when I when I was referring to that, I was I was really referring to how children need constant rewards for what they do in order to build that relationship. Um, okay. But. But I, I, I kind of feel as I've got older, and this might have thrown a spanner in the works to, to maybe some of the typical kind of ideas around it. But as I've got older, I don't I don't feel like I need as much rewarding, personal rewarding, group rewarding for what I do. I feel the satisfaction in achieving that myself. And I kind of, you know, internalize that as, you know, I've achieved this. I feel a sense of pride with it. But very, very quickly, I'm on to the next thing. Like, I'm just I'm just excited by the acceleration from one thing to the next. So the, I think that's end- interesting. That's interesting, though, Seb, I think, because... You know, as human beings, we desire progress, right? That's what we're mm. here to do. So what you've just described there beautifully, for me anyway, is a the reward is in the progress. Yeah, yeah. You can see movement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and it's, you know, I, I often find, you know, if you, if you do something really well in business, you're like, okay, cool. When I get to that goal, then I'm going to reward myself with mm. whatever, a new car or this or a holiday. Mm. And every time I've tried to do that, I've got to that place and I've been like, I could I could reward myself for that, or I could kind of throw that money into building another business or another you know stream of income or another venture or even a charity or whatever it is, which builds more momentum and you know I'm excited mm-hmm. again by that kind of acceleration. So so you know for me it's it's I'm I'm very very aware as I grow from one stage to the next stage that this is a it's a kind of a self-rewarding process which just yeah. happens and I just enjoy the whole journey of it you know it doesn't matter if it goes up and down or sideways I, I just I, I know what I've signed up to right and then I just enjoy the journey through it. Let's look again at one of the secret ingredients Seb's mentioning here one that we so often forget and yet is integral to becoming better under pressure the power of celebration in growing belief When we take time to celebrate both together and individually, we're reinforcing the relationship between pressure and success and building a sense of pride and courage to continue. And how when we celebrate as a team, we're creating a community of support for when things don't go so well. Collectively enjoying the journey and the progress, whether it goes as Seb describes it, up, down or sideways. It made me think about how often celebration is overlooked, particularly when we're feeling under pressure. Actually investing time and energy in celebration can power up both personal and collective self-belief and potentially lay the foundations for a system that builds intrinsic motivation. I'm um, reflecting on your distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation because, you know, as an ex-teacher myself, I became very aware of that. The majority of every class were intrinsic extrinsically motivated so they needed the 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 mark they needed the sense of you know um acknowledgement but randomly you'd meet one child and I'm thinking of one in particular actually who never needed that he Mm. never needed that he was a very high achiever and actually didn't even when you marked his work it it, it didn't really care Mm. and yet it didn't but it didn't stop him from wanting to 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 be better so I'm wondering, in your story, with the reward was extrinsically there and then it became intrinsic, or whether it was always intrinsic, Seb, for you. I'm just very curious about that. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, isn't it? What has it always been intrinsic? I think I think as a young man, you typically base your kind of the way in which you approach you know, growth and stuff onto your father and it, your relationship between you and your dad as a young bloke is kind of vital, right? Um, you know, for those who have a male role model in their lives. And and I think that I've seen a, in a lot of cases where, you know, a young boy hasn't had that praise as he's grown up and they actually spend the rest of their life trying to seek praise from their, yeah. their father figure, even if their father's absent, right? So they go through their whole life not getting that. Um, whereas I, I feel like, you know, the relationship I had with my dad, he was always very... You know, he, he had very high standards, but he was also very, very supportive. 
um, throughout that. So it's really hard for me to say, was it intrinsic or, or extrinsic? I feel like I was part of a system which taught me how to develop intrinsic motivation. And, you know, that's the strategy we use with, with martial arts, right? So when a child joins us, if you look at the black belt journey, they go from white belt to black belt, you're typically, you know, three to four months between each belt for the first four or five belts. We go even further than the Warrior Academy and there's lots of little stages between each belt as well. So every single week they're trying to earn something to get to the next stage. So those are very, very close together. Mm. And then as they start to develop this drive and this relationship with pressure, you start to move these big goals further apart. Now the belts are six to eight months apart. Then they're 12 to 15 months apart. And then they can be two to three years apart. And one of the funny things I say to, to our parents is, you know, when you're, when you're first joining us, your kids are white belt, you're packing them bags, trying to get them to get to class and, you know, really encouraging them to be there. But when your child is a black tag going for their black belt, they're packing your bags. They're trying to get you to get to class early so they can, you know, go and go and perform in the class. And so that's, that's the achievement, right? It's, it's, it's being in that system, which encourages you to, to have that intrinsic motivation and, and handle pressure and, and internalize pressure in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating on so many levels here. So is there a moment that really feels like that was that was the toughest pressure I've ever had to deal with and I came through it? Being quite a few of those, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> I have to try and pick one. Um, hmm. The toughest pressure. Something that really stands out to me would be um, when I did my first professional fight in Thailand. So... I was sitting in this restaurant after, you know, in Thailand after several months of training up for this fight, right? And as I, as I, as I sit at the restaurant eating my last meal before I go and do this fight, I look at these the posters that have all been handed out around the, the restaurant. And on the poster was a big picture of me and a big picture of this Thai fighter. And it looks like I'm the main event, but there's, you know, there's got to be a mistake with that because it's my first fight. Why would I be the, the main event? And it's it's during the Queen's birthday in Thailand. So it's this massive event in Thailand. And so I, I grab this poster and I speak to one of the other local Thai guys. And I'm like, you know, this is me. Who am I against? And they 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 found it quite funny. And then they looked at me and they realized, oh, you know, this is actually quite serious. The guy you're against is a veteran fighter with over 40 fights. And so, you know, I realized kind of in that moment, I'd been set up to lose. So in Thailand, what they often do is actually fix fights so that people lose. They'll put a really experienced person against a beginner so that they can put them in a situation where they can bet on the winner who they know is going to win and they make lots of money. There's a lot of gambling in Thailand. So I, I've been set up to lose this fight. Um, and I can just, you know, I can feel, even now kind of talking about it, I can feel, you know, <laughs> the same feelings of, I, you know, being set up to lose is a horrible feeling. And knowing it's a bit like going to the guillotine, knowing you have no choice. So I jumped on my motorbike and I and I went down to my mentor, uh, Ped, who was, uh, who, you know, been training me up for this fight eight hours every day, living and breathing uh, Thai boxing with me. Uh, you know, a trainer is very much involved with the fight. It, they are so attached to the win and lose of this and the emotional side of building up for that just as much yeah. as a fighter. And so I knock on his door, push open the door, and he's there lying on the on a mattress on the floor with a fan on him and his, and his son and um, his wife as well. And he comes to the door. And he, he looks at me and he realizes, you know, that I'm fighting in an hour and I'm mentally not ready. And, you know, I, I show him the, the poster and he then realizes in that moment that I'd been set up to lose. And um, he didn't he didn't directly say that to me, but I could see it. I could see his face drop. Right. And so I'm looking at my trainer. And I'm thinking, shit, I've been set up to lose. And I, all I want to do is escape. So I'm just yes. thinking, you know, here's the pressure. I want to escape. What can I do to get out of this? Can he make a phone call and change the fighter? What can he do? <laughs> and, you know, can I just cancel? Yes. And, and so, you know, what, what he did, and it was, and he absolutely nailed it as a mentor, right? He looked at me in the eyes. He put his hand out on my heart, on my chest here, and you could feel my heart rate just going through the roof. And he said to me, he looked at me in the eyes and he said to me, not matter, you fight you. And I realized right up until that point, 
there had been no fighter that I was against. I didn't know who the other person was. They could be having hundreds of, you know, professional fights. It didn't matter. No one was forcing me to be in that ring every single day, eight hours every single day, the diet, the training, the sacrifice, everything. Every time I was training, it was just me against me anyway. So this was no different. And what was really cool about it was everyone there was expecting me to lose. So I kind of... Yeah. I kind of approached that pressure as actually just turning up. I've kind of done a good job, right? And so and then I, I, I jumped on the back of a motorbike with him. We went down to the, the arena, jumped in the ring, tapped gloves with this guy, this faceless fighter. I didn't care who he was. I was kind of filled with, with courage at that point. And I think when you watch, when, you, when, you, when you're filled with courage and you watch yourself do it, almost kind of third person watching yourself yeah. do yeah. something that two minutes ago, even though you're in the moment, you're still feeling that fear it starts to build confidence and there's this almost this question right of what if i could what if i could actually do this you know what if i could win this and so i'm fighting this guy and in my whole strategy was low kicks so if i can get him with low kicks he was renowned for you know getting in close contact elbows knees this sort of stuff all close range strikes so i wanted to keep a distance do lo low kicks to his legs which worked you know three or four kicks in i could see he was starting to feel it but then um, then he blocked one of my kicks perfectly and it tore one of the muscles in my left calf, my right calf. And so now I was limping. I was in the third round and I could see Ped in the distance over there. And he was trying to show me to use a, use a punch. And so that's all right. I switched to, to punching, um, even though I realized that I had to then step in even further. So I think the pressure of building up to that fight, being set up to lose, yep. getting injured during the fight, even though I felt like I had taken on as much pressure as I could, and then making the decision to go even further when I couldn't do more, just thinking to myself, if I just, I just go for it, you know, just go for it, just, you know, one minute more. And then I, I knocked the guy out in the third round and, and you know, I'd won the match. Um, and it was, it was, it, I had to leave very quickly because a lot of the gamblers are very upset, right? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> just packed out the stadium. But for me, it was, it was understanding you know how noticing yourself when you go through something of yeah. high pressure noticing how your body reacts yeah and just observing yeah. because often what happens is people feel this it's crippling yeah. and they stop but yeah. instead observing how your body's reacting and when yeah. i talk about base jumping and stuff there is a physical reaction Absolutely. like you stand on the edge of a cliff when you base jump and you're watching your legs yeah. shake right you're literally your body's shaking like this and you're just observing the pressure taking its effect on your body and just just noticing it and it's there to keep you alive right so i'm just i just kind of when i'm in that position i just kind of thank my body for being there to support me but being a bit like i got this now i'll take over from here slow oh. down my breathing and then now i'm in control bang ready to go i love that seb <laughs> i love that for so many reasons because you know okay so this was an extreme example but this Physical sensation first is so important, I think, for all mm -hmm. of us in pressure, is that our body gives us fantastic signals. And what you're saying is you're having a conversation. I mean, my word is you go meta on the feeling. You almost yeah. distance, you go meta, you look at it and you go, OK, thanks. I understand that you're, you're looking after me. Yes, this is a big event and I should be you know, concerned, but I've got it. I've got this. Yeah. Um makes so much sense I think even if you know even if it's a meeting you're scared of or even if it's you know a conversation that you you, you feel under pressure for I think this this body connection with what you're about to go to in pressure is the is the thing that you have to master yeah in, yeah, in quite definitely. a strong way and it's part of the drill and I, I love I, when you when you talked talked about your um your mentor your trainer putting his hand on on your heart I can remember going when I was doing some work on with neurolinguistics. I remember somebody uh, just literally taking somebody on stage and putting their hand on their heart and then tapping it out with a stick. Wow! And so you could hear how fast the the the, the heart was going, but because yeah. because you almost gone meta on it by distancing yourself because you were the, you were analysing it through the, mm. the stick, you could it started to slow. Yeah. Do, do you know what? I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by incredible mentors all my life. For, fortunate or I've sought them out, right? And um, one, of, one of my mentors in base jumping, he would, he would say to me, if, you, if I was to ask you to stand on one leg, right? Stand on one leg on the floor and just slow down your breathing, you, you could do that no problem. There's absolutely no difference to doing that on the edge of a cliff. You stand on one foot on the edge of a cliff and you slow down your breathing, then 
you know, you're in control, right? There's no, there's no reason any of that's different apart from the psycho psychosomatic response of you dealing with fear. And so, you know, I used to do that before every, before every jump, I used to stand on one leg. And, and if I couldn't control myself, then I, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to control fine, mo you know, fine motor action. So I wouldn't jump. If I, if I couldn't show myself that I can control my breathing, doing a simple task, regardless of my geographical situation, wherever I am, then I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would try to remove myself from that situation because I'm just not in the place to do it mentally. The point that Seb highlights throughout these examples that I think is really worth banking is the importance of having a way to get fully present with a moment of pressure so we feel in control. We will always feel pressure physically first. It's our body reacting to any surprise so we need a practice that reassures us. One that, despite the physical sensations we're experiencing, allows us to feel that we are nevertheless in control. I love this idea of being on the edge of a cliff and thinking, if I can stand on one leg and control my breathing, I'm good to go. And if I can't, I'm not mentally up for it. This is so useful when it comes to reassuring ourselves that we are more resourceful than we think. Creating a ritual that stress tests our own agency in pressure situations so we can turn any pressure we face into a positive force that we can grow from. I don't think it matters where we are on the better under pressure scale, but having a ritual that helps us talk to the fear and say, do you know what, it's okay, thank you, I've got this, or thank you, I agree, now isn't the time. Either way, we are in control of the choice, whatever our metaphorical cliff may be. So let's just get that straight. You're up a, cl a cliff, Hi. I mean, yeah. when you talk about base jumps, we're not talking about little jumps, are we, Seb? Let's just be clear about this. Could you just give us a description of a typical base jump, please? Yeah, but do you know what? With base jumping, the 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 lower the jumps, the more dangerous because you've got less time to open your parachute and that sort of stuff. So the the jumps oh, like okay. of, you know small cliffs and antennas and buildings and bridges, they're actually more dangerous than the ah. than the than the bigger jumps. But the yeah, typical typical jump. One one of the, one of the jumps I've done hundreds of times um, is a, you know a beautiful cliff in Italy. Uh, called Monte Bento. and it's this you know you you hike for four hours up to this and you it's sunrise and um you know you're standing on the edge of this this cliff point and in front of you several it's three thousand foot drop in front of you there and you're kind of living in this environment where the eagles live you know and mm -hmm. all the only thing up there is just like birds birds of prey just kind of going around and it's just completely silent and you're you it, it's there's something very spiritual about base jumping because it's it's almost it's almost very primitive and takes you back to the what it what it makes what it is to be a human being right and with, with such a busy modern life that we all lift and you know in, in so so many ways so soft to go in that very raw existence where you're standing on a, the top of a mountain feeling the wind and it's just you and empty space in front of you and you're the one making a decision to go or not, there's always this moment when your, your feet are on the edge of a cliff and, you know, there's like a point of no return, right? You have to push off. But you, right now, you, when your feet are on the edge of the cliff, you're standing still, you're safe, you're not doing anything. But then you lean forward a little bit and there's this moment where you're still on the cliff, but you're too far leaning forward to be safe anymore. <laughs> so you, you have now decided you basically left the cliff, even though you're still attached to it. And I think that's a that's a really interesting um, moment, right? Because you're right in the middle of whatever's going to happen. Um, and then you know when you when you do jump off a cliff, there's there's dead air first. So everyone practices in a skydive. When you do a skydive, it's windy, it's noisy. As soon as you jump out the plane, you know immediately you're you're you know you're you're hitting friction with the air. So there's no dead air. With by the, the concept of dead air is that basically there's no there's not enough speed for you to move in the wind. So when you when you jump off a cliff in a base jump, immediately you just drop two or three hundred feet, and it feels exactly like dropping two or three hundred feet. Um, but one of the things I also say about pressure or fear is that you can get used to anything. So people often say to me, you know, what does that what does that feel like? And I, actually, it feels pretty normal because you can get used to it, right? That yeah. butterfly feeling you get when you jump off a high diving board that only lasts a few seconds, and then a few seconds after that, believe it or not, even though your body's falling several hundred feet you're actually able to breathe in, out, slow down, and then you've got friction with the wind and you can start controlling your movement. Yeah. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of a, you know, a more raw insight into a base jump and what it's, what it's like to jump off a cliff. Do you, what do you feel about the connect? Do you ever use that connection that you've just 
beautifully described there with decision making. Like, this might feel like a random question, but I'm quite intrigued as to, and I was intrigued when I spoke to Tendi as well, is there's something about the physical pressure that you put yourself under in an extreme situation, like a base jump, for example. What can you learn from that that enables you to make a decision you might have to make in your business? Or, you know, you, you told me, Seb, that during COVID, you know, your business tanked. You had to make some very quick decisions to revamp mm. it. Like, what's the relationship for you around your past and your 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 high pressure physical endeavors to now running a business and the decisions that you're making that may me not involve jumping, but they're still high pressure decisions? Is there any connection you make? Yeah, absolutely. So so much carryover from extreme sports to to the business world. You know, so many people that I mentor, and I mentor, you know, several hundred people in business throughout the year. So many people that I mentor, they they just they've got amazing ideas. They're so creative and they're they're they they can help so many people, but they just struggle to hit go. Right. Yeah. And it's like, and it, when you and as you as you mentor people, it's just kind of frustrating because you're like, ah, oh, I wish I could just kind of give you that ability just to hit go. <laughs> because yeah. you've, it's like it's what you're doing is relatively safe. You don't, you know, you're, you're the way in which people are approaching it is that this is, if it goes wrong, it's the end of the world. And the, the gift of something of doing extreme sports where it's, you're doing something very, very dangerous is that you have a very different perspective on life. Um, you know, it's that in terms of the relationship, it's perspective. What makes decision-making easier is perspective, right? Like, if you're making a business decision, like you're quitting your job to go and, you know, run a business or start your own business, you know, what, what's the real risk? Like, you're not going to die, are you? you? Do you know what I mean? It's it's like, okay, you might, you might, you know, if it doesn't work, it might set you back a couple of years financially. You might have to go and get another job. At least you tried. What's the, what's the upside of this? What's, you know, one of the things you talk about is playing to win, right? Not mm -hmm. playing not to lose. And mm -hmm. I absolutely love that when I looked at the, when I looked at the energy uh, diagram as well. And, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I see so many people who just need to shift in the, into that way of thinking. What if this is the right way? You know, this 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 route will actually cause this knock-on effect, which will help me in whatever I'm doing in life. And and so the, the carryover really for me is perspective. Um, one of the great things about base jumping is you're constantly in a flow state. You're not thinking about your emails when you're jumping off a cliff. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a case of you you become very good at um becoming present because yeah. you train yourself so much that you you need to think about this one thing with laser focus and nothing else can distract you because that one thing with laser focus is going to mean you live or you die and it's as simple as that i mean you're in that community of based something as well you you kind of see death quite a lot you hear about it your friends go all this sort of stuff so the pressure there is enormous because you're doing the same things that have killed people a week ago and yeah. so it's it's no joke right you 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 go up and you make the decision to do it despite all that and so it, it all it all comes down to your perspective. And one of the things I you know I often when I, before I'm making a really big decision, um, or if I'm if I feel myself having this scarcity mindset, is I will do something um, which really grounds me but helps me with perspective. And that's essentially I just accept the worst case scenario. So I take a piece of paper and I write down everything that could go wrong. It's like doomsday stuff, right? You know, this, this, you know, I do this, we'll be bankrupt. We won't be able to do this. I won't be able to afford to pay staff. And, you know, if the hospital bill comes in, I won't be able to pay that. I have to move out. I have to move back to England. I have to move my whole family to a studio apartment somewhere. We'll be homeless. Like, this is the worst yeah. case scenario. Right? That piece of paper, I don't leave the, the desk until I've read through that piece of paper and created a plan for what, what, I, would, what I would do in that situation. So it's very practical, right? You know, I'm a, I'm a practical guy. I, you know, all this motivation and, you know, Tony Robbins, hoo-ha stuff, that's all great. And it gives people that motivation, that burst. But I'm very much like, cool, what are the steps we can actually take to, you know, to control your mind and be in control? And this is one of them. So you take that worst case scenario and then you make a plan for that. Like you, you basically accept that this has happened. Yeah. So the worst case scenario has happened. You've now got a plan for it. You take that piece of paper and you stick it in a drawer. Now you're able to fully focus on playing to win. Yeah. You've taken that scarcity mindset, you know, the play not to lose, or how did you, how did you phrase it? Playing not to lose. 
as opposed cool. to play not to lose. lose. And you've taken that piece of paper and it's in a draw. Bang, the draw shuts. Now all of your energy, because you've accepted that, right? All of your energy is now focusing on the positive side of what if I can yeah. do this? What if I can become the person who does this? And if you look at, um, you know, cultures from the past, right? You look at the Vikings, look at um, who are incredibly courageous, right? Look at um, the samurai, the Bushido code, all this sort of stuff. Mm. They fully accepted death. Yes. And for yes. them, it, they had they had such a connection to death that it was like they, they were quite happy to go to war, to go into battle, whatever it was, with this full understanding that they might die. And if they did, it would bring honor to them and their families or whatever, right? As long as they were doing and they were living with courage. Yes. And so I take that same approach to, to business. That's oh. I literally took that culture and I put it into business. Um, there's so much resonating for me. I mean, a, a pers a, well, personally, I did something with um, um, a fabulous group that I'm part of called the Samurai Challenge in the summer, Seb. I never had a chance to talk to you about this, but it it was it was exactly trying to connect your body to the a war situation without going to war. Mm. Um, and so much of his drilling this, the, uh, with us was about the breath, getting right down in the pelvis um, yeah. and feeling grounded. And that, that moment mm. of presence that you're talking about in, in adversity and having to make fast decisions when basically the whole game messes with your head um, was so helpful. I found it so enriching and so powerful as, as a mechanism, this whole sort of samurai uh, way of working. Um, but also yeah. you're reminding me of other guests that I've had on the podcast, like Anna Rafferty from Lego, you know, ferocious prioritization. What's it, it was, what was her, was her phrase, you know, when we're not, I love that. That's a great we're phrase. Not, it, it was a really good, powerful phrase. And, um, and Julie Harris, who said, the thing she says is what's the worst that can happen. And when you yeah. really look at what's the worst that can happen, you can then mitigate it, or at least you can then yeah. prepare yourself for it, or realize yeah. that actually it's not that bad after all, to be honest, when you really face it. So um, this practice of getting out of scarcity and into possibility feels very powerful. Yeah. And uh, do you know what, though? It's, it's one of, you know, like I said to you, a lot of people talk about this sort of stuff, but to actually have techniques that do it, I agree. That, do, you know, do you know what I mean? It's it shouldn't just be a chat that you listen on a podcast and and you know oh cool yeah we should not be we shouldn't have a scarcity mindset. No no no. Like you need to teach yourself not to. There are exercises to do. <laughs> yeah. To do yeah. this, you know, and and it take it takes work. Like you've got to put the work in. And uh, you know I, I use base jumping and in extreme sports because they're very extreme examples of of ultimately being close to the worst case scenario. And having the courage and the decisiveness to make decisions very quickly that are, you know, life or death situations, right? But you don't just go from zero to 100. You don't just do that and then that's it. Um, you know, you, it, you build up to that. You take small steps, you know, for people who are listening to this and they, you know, they struggle with making decisions on the spot. You know, one of the great ways you can do that is by you know, doing it through sport, right? If you can find a, a fast paced sport that, that requires you to make decisions on the spot, that's one way of doing it, right? And that could be as part of a team or it could be individually. If you do it individually, that's, that's a great way of doing it, um, you know, because then it, it's all on you and it's yeah. that, that all on you energy and being okay with it being all, being on, all you, on you. That's leadership, right? You know, I, I was speaking to one of my managers the other day and he, and he was, um, he's taking over an event with about 300 people from me. And, you know, I, I said to him, look, you're, you're, you know, you're taking this over from me, you're in charge. Um, and I said, how are you, how do you, how are you feeling about that? And he was like, yeah, I'm a little, you know, I'm excited, but nervous and a little bit anxious and worried, you know, what if things go wrong? And I said to him at the end of the day, if things go wrong, I'm the last one out the door. You know, it's all on me. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're in my team, it's all on me. You guys make a mistake. It comes back to me. You know, if this whole event goes goes wrong, it's on me. And so I think I think that's leadership, right? Just having ownership over decisions. And, and that doesn't come from just, you don't just do that straight away. You build up to it through practice gradually. Yeah. Let's stick on that for a little minute, moment, Seb, about how mm -hmm. you've now broke, you've grown your business. You've got lots of people working with you and for you right now. And yeah. you're having a huge impact on children across the world, which is really inspiring mission to be to be honest but you know as you've always said and I so agree inspiration comes from real solid 
practice and effort. Um, how do you build it? You know, how how is it that you are? I suppose the question is, how do you manage other people's pressure? Because you're going to have that. You've just given an example of one. But as you get more and more people working with you and for you, what would you say is a is a key requirement for managing others pressure particularly if it doesn't bother you like you know you you've probably got quite an immune system to pressure now that's pretty strong right but you're you're dealing with people that don't have that often or there are building their immune system to it so that it can be a positive force in the way that we've been talking about how do you do that with people then you bring them into your team have you ever had a, a mentor who believed in you when you didn't believe in yourself Yes, it's for me, it's becoming that person for them. Right. So what what I often say to parents, but we train their children, as I say, when you're trying to inspire someone, the first way in which you inspire them is through language. When you speak to someone, you literally paint a picture of what they'll become. So what I do, if I'm trying to inspire a leader to take over something or I'm delegating and I need someone to take over something quite important, you know, I'll I'll sit down with them and I'll say, look, I don't know if you're, you're aware of this. But I can really, really visualize you as this person. And then I'll describe that person in detail, right? So it becomes very visual in their mind. And I'll say that, you know, I'll say to them, look, in my mind, you're already this person. Like I've, I've seen you do this in my head a million times. And until, until they kind of feel, oh, yeah, I could do that. And I'm going to, and I say to them, look, now for you to actually become that person, there are a few steps to take. And the steps are very, very simple, very, very predictable. And I'll guide you through those steps as we go. But you've got to be outside of your comfort zone for that journey. So the first thing is inspiring someone to actually want to become this character that you've imagined for them, someone who can handle that pressure, who can achieve those things. And um, the next thing that you find is that on this journey, they they kind of go off track, they go off piece, right? And so perspective becomes really important. Mm. Perspective is, you know, joy, if, this, if this is a 10 point journey, right? Point four, they're feeling low, they've, you know, they've experienced failure. It's making sure they're reflective of where they've come and, yes. and you know, sitting them back and saying, do you remember when I sat down with you and I painted this picture of where you were going to become and you didn't believe any of these steps were possible? And then I describe that person that I met. I'll actually describe that person and say they struggle with this. They look like this. They worked on this. This was their focus. This was their mindset. This is the things they said to me. And then it's then it's like a physical, oh, man, I've really come a long way since that chat. These things happen up and down, perspective. And then the techniques I, I speak about with accepting the worst case scenario, you know, this, this, this sort of back and forth of, you know, what if this goes wrong? What if it goes wrong? You know, like you're not going to die, are you? What if it goes wrong? What if it goes right? What if it goes right? You become this person. If it goes wrong, we just try again. And so I think I think perspective and and believing in people and and inspiring through words and and painting a picture of what they can become. And it, you know, it's mindset stuff, but it's all very practical, statical style. So practical, but so important. And what I what I really respect about this conversation about this element of raising others games holding them able is a phrase i like to use hold people Mm. able because they're not able to hold themselves so you hold them able and i think there's some gold dust in just what you've just shared said for one-to-one meetings in organizations what i typically hear is that one-to-ones get bumped by their their leaders uh Mm. you know everything becomes too busy or when they do have the one-to-ones it's very tactical it's like i'm coming with my list of things to do I'm going to come with my list of things to do. And it's about let's getting through the tactical list of things to do. What I love about what you're describing here, which I think is so essential, particularly in this current uncertain, volatile world, is the leader's responsibility to hold people able and for them to be able to spend some time together understanding who you can be in order to achieve that. Yeah. As opposed to just the achievement list and what you need to get through. It's like, who are you? Who are you becoming? How can I help you become that? So that together we become even more powerful as a business. Do you know, do you know what I think it is? I think it's connecting the the practical, like, you know, you, you are, you've got this job title, you've achieved this, blah, 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 with an actual feeling. So they actually yes. feel it, right? Yes. What, you know, the one of the questions I ask is, is what would, you know, I've described this person. What would it feel like? For you to wake up in the morning and know that you're this person, to know that you've got that responsibility and to know that you can handle it. 
what does that what does that feel like mm. and you know someone might explain to you various feelings you know pride they attach pride to it right uh you know I, I feel inspired okay there's you know you attach inspiration to it i feel like i've got a legacy or i'm building a legacy okay cool i feel like i'm providing security to my family you attach that to it so you're basically building up this big emotional reason of why they need to get shit done yeah so it, you don't as a leader you don't need to be there oh you know you're okay motivation motivation all the time that is intrinsic this person wants what what's out there and that comes from them and so i think I think connecting it emotionally with the outcome is, yeah. is super important when you're trying to inspire a leader. Yeah. For me, the big emphasis here is in the power of the language we choose when supporting others under pressure. What Seb's describing is how he uses carefully chosen words to evoke an emotional connection for the person in front of him, to why what they're doing matters, why it's worth the extra effort, to power up their commitment and belief so they can achieve more than they think is possible. And what makes this even more powerful is talking to them about themselves in the third person. It distances them from themselves so that they can observe and appreciate what's possible. Emotions move us. The word emotions even has motion at its heart. Connecting ourselves and others emotionally to a moment in the future through a compelling and vivid picture can move us out of negative pressure and into a pressure that's galvanizing. It's the power of what I call a feel purpose. Here's a summary of the points Seb shared when he supports others through moments of pressure. One, power up their belief through the words you choose. Two, offer them a wider perspective. Three, paint a vivid and compelling future picture of what is possible. Four, remind them of how far they've already come. And five, reframe what if it goes wrong to well, what if it goes right? It's a lovely segue, Seb, for you to um, offer your two pay forwards. So if someone's listening to this podcast and they're wanting to be better under pressure, from your point of view, what would be the two things you would pass to them? What would be your first So uh, I think, I think um, I've spoken a lot of what if already. Like one of the things I always say to people is what if, right? And I, and I know we've talked a little bit about that uh, a few times in this what if you could do it? What if you could become the person who does this? And and, that, and that's borderline motivation for me, which I which I'm you know cautious not to give. <laughs> <laughs> so I um so I'd rather give something practical. Okay. So Go ahead. something practical is for a long time I was I was given med- meditation coaching, right? Um, training my mind um, through meditation, mindfulness, this sort of stuff, and. What I what I loved about that was I took the lessons from that and I turned them into something very practical. <laughs> Good. And um, and it's funny when you, when you talk about meditation, right? Just to go off piece a little bit. If I if I asked you to to train every day for an hour or you know every other day for an hour, right? Lifting weights or whatever it was, you could probably do it and stick to it for six months, yeah. But if I said to you, I want you to do nothing, sit still, close your eyes, focus on your breathing for ten minutes every day, <laughs> you'd probably struggle to keep up with it. Why do people struggle so much with meditation? Probably because they, um, you know, they can't see the tangible results, the physical response, right? Um, so I've got some techniques for that. But in terms of a practical technique, I use handling pressure is all about perspective. Perspective is influenced by your mindset, um, and your thoughts influence your mindset. So you've constantly got this, you know, positive, negative, you know, scarcity, abundance, thoughts and mindset coming in. And so a scarcity mindset is actually there to serve you. All of your thoughts are there to serve you. The scarcity mindset ones just tend to have terrible timing because it comes at a time where you're about to make a decision where you need courage, right? So one of the, one of the techniques I use is, you know, when, when, you're, when you're meditating, you close your eyes and, you, you, you know, a, a negative thought comes in and one of the things I've taught myself to do is to, is to say thank you for the thoughts because they're there to serve me in some way, not look at them like some sort of negative thing. So thank you for the thoughts, park it and move on. But the practical element of this is I'll literally have on my phone, I've got a little notepad on my phone and I write, you know, I've written like 5,000 notes a, a year or something on there. Yeah. And um, on that phone, one of the titles and it's pinned to the top, it says, thank you for the thoughts. Whenever a negative or a scarcity mindset idea comes into my mind, you know, we're not going to be able to sell this product or I'm not going to be able to achieve this goal or, you know, we're not going to be able to do this. I'll write it down in there. So I've taken the negative thought. I've written it down to this notepad. And then I said, thank you for the thoughts. And I've closed the phone. And then when I'm in this positive mindset and I'm feeling like I've got this abundance mindset, 
I'll go into that notepad and reply to that thought. Now I'm in a better place to actually process that thought. You don't want, you don't want to process it and try and, and provide logic around a scarcity mindset concept, right? So thank you for the thoughts, park it, and then you come back when you're feeling energized, you're feeling, you know, you've got motivation to do this, you've got an abundance mindset, eh? your energy is all playing to win. When the, when the yes. energy of playing not to lose comes in, you park the thoughts. When the energy is playing to win, now you're in the place where you take action. We can do this because if you look at the past, over the last six months, I've achieved A, B, and C. That's all possible. I know that having looked at the, you know, looking logically over the next six months, looking at the data, it's likely we can do this. And I literally reason with that person. So I imagine. So again, you go meta, you go meta on yourself again, and almost like, you know, that's so interesting because again, Anna Rafferty referenced that she's got a voice. She, her, her thing is that she has a voice message. So Mm. she speaks to herself. And if it's not clear, she lets it all out into, into a voice note. And then she goes and does something completely else. Like, yeah. Then she comes back to it and listens to it and then coaches herself on the voicemail. So it's a yeah. similar thing, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Do you know it. what? We're, 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 we're always coaching. We're always being coached, right? Yes. Whether it's someone else coaching us, influencing us, or, or it's ourselves. ourselves. And, and yeah. you know, you, you've got to understand that there's an inner coach who's always yes. influencing you all the time. And it's yes. giving them the microphone when, you know, when, it, when you're in the right energy. And yeah. taking the microphone off them when, when they yeah. haven't had their coffee. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's um for me it's so really true. Keep me aware of that. So true. It's like we're always practicing something. Yeah. Yeah. That's whether what we're practicing is the most useful thing. Brilliant. Number two, Seb. What would you say? Number is your two. Second number two won't won't be as long. I promise. Okay. Uh, number <laughs> number two. Number two. I would I would say this. I once had a um, a parent um, that we interviewed. Uh, we interviewed the daughter for our book, Not a Victim, which is all about anti-bullying. And the daughter went through depression, um, she was suicidal, it was a really extreme case. And um, her dad was a fantastic mentor. And one of the things he would say to her as his daughter was going through this, is he would say, just hold on when you're feeling like that just for another five minutes, right? Just for another day. And that energy of just hold on and that mantra you know, one more minute. If it's something short you've got to do, like when I was fighting in Thailand and I'm in, the, I'm, you know, I'm injured and it's like, oh my God, you know, there's no way I'm going to survive that. I'm going to get knocked out any second. Just hold on. And, um, you know, you're in business and you've got to make a, a big pitch somewhere and you're feeling nervous. Just hold on. And um, I tie that very much to the energy of what if. Just hold on. What if you could do this? And so yeah. what I find is that people tend to give up when they see themselves and they feel that they can't do something. But if you just hold on literally, you know, 20, 30 seconds after that and you breathe through it, that's where typically most of the gold happens. The reality is most people can't do that. They get to that stage, it becomes too much and they they exit, right? Yeah. But that's why all the good stuff happens just after that because it's people you can just hold on. And if you have that mantra in your head, you tend to just hold on for that little bit longer. Those people tend to experience far more success in life. They're able to handle more pressure. And ultimately, if you're able to handle more pressure in life, we're able, we get rewarded for that, right? Like if you can handle more pressure, life will reward you more. And so it's having little techniques like that, which I, I think really helped me with, with handling pressure. Pressure for better. I 100%. love it, Seb. Thank you so much. What a great and energizing conversation. I loved it. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Better Under Pressure with me, Sarah Milne Rowe. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe and let us know what you found useful or what you'd like to know more about. Our aim is to share as many examples as possible of what people do to manage pressure for better. If you're interested in any of the practices mentioned, check out my book, The Shed Method. Alternatively, you can find us at Coaching Impact or me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Better Under Pressure was produced by the fab team at Smart Cookie Media. Thanks so much for listening and until next time, goodbye.